so we've talked about proteins in a non-catalytic sense. Um, we've talked about our structural proteins. Um, though when you talk about muscle contraction and relaxation, there is catalysis there. Um, but here we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. And we're going to talk about the molecules known as enzymes. Enzymes are commonly known as biological catalysts. Um, they are proteins that catalyze a specific reaction. Um, so what does an enzyme do? Enzymes catalyze thermodynamically favorable reactions, causing them to proceed at an extraordinarily rapid rate. Enzymes provide cells with the ability to exert kinetic control over thermodynamic potentiality. Living systems use enzymes to accelerate and control the rates of vitally important biochemical reactions. So whether or not, a, you know, to speed up a reaction or to halt a reaction in its, its, in its place, um, an enzyme is kind of a key cog in that. Uh, enzymes are the agents of metabolic function. Now, enzymes do so many different things. And like what we've talked about with amino acids, classification of it, uh, classification is very important for organizing information. And enzymes are really kind of no different. Uh, enzymes, based on the reactions that they catalyze, much like if you think back to Gen Chem 1, you learned about classifying a reaction. You said this is a decomposition reaction, or this is a synthesis reaction or combustion reaction. Well, we take the enzyme or the reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes and organize them. And what is pretty commonplace is this numbering scheme that is that was established by a group called the Enzyme Commission. And these are a total of six different major categories. Category one, two, three, four, five, and six. I'm going to go through a couple of examples of these reactions in the, the successive steps here, but I expect you and I want you to know, for instance, one, if a number, if an enzyme has one out front, then it is an oxidoreductase. So this numbering scheme, which we'll get into in a little while, is kind of like an I always think about it as like an address, like an IP address or some sort of identifier that says the first number classifies you as being an oxidoreductase. The next number, so this 1.1, is going to say you're an oxidoreductase that acts on CHOH group of donors. 1.1.1 says that you will utilize NAD or NADP as an acceptor. And then finally, if you saw something like 1.1.1.1, that is a specific enzyme. So that is the actual enzyme. Um, and I'll talk about those numbers a little bit more in just a moment. But first, what I wanted to do was introduce you to the six major categories. Your first major category is the oxidoreductases. You have an oxidation reduction reaction taking place. One thing is getting oxidized, one thing is getting reduced. And the example that we're going to utilize is lactate dehydrogenase. Lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, is an enzyme that takes the molecule lactate and NAD, which NAD plus, is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and produces pyruvate and NADH, okay? Now, what I want you to take away from this is that these molecules, lactate and NAD plus, and pyruvate and NADH, are, well, one thing is going to get oxidized, one thing is going to get reduced. Now, if you think back to Gen Chem 1, you probably learned about, well, sodium goes to Na plus plus an electron. And this is an example of oxidation because the gain of an electron is reduction and the loss of an electron is oxidation. Now, if you rewrote this as Na plus plus E yields Na, well, that would be reduction. What really matters here is where is the electron going and where is it coming from, okay? So I'm gonna erase all of this 
Now, personally, the way that I like to think about this is I like to just look at it and say, okay, where's my positive? Well, NAD plus. NAD plus is a substance that goes from having a charge to NADH, and therefore does not have a charge. So we have a substance NAD plus going to NADH, go something with a positive charge going to something that's neutral. How do we do that? Well, to take the Gen Chem 1 approach, we added an electron to this. So NAD plus, is it getting oxidized or getting reduced? Is it gaining electron or is it losing electron? It's gaining electron, hence this is reduction. <laughs> Thus, lactate gets oxidized to form pyruvate. Now, those are two important terms, but also if you think back to organic, you probably talked about an oxidizing agent and a reducing agent. And I think the easiest way to think about that is the oxidizing agent. Well, that gets reduced. And the reducing agent gets oxidized. So keeping that terminology straight is important, but I think that you can kind of jump off from what gets oxidized, what gets reduced, to then fill in the blanks on what is the reducing agent and which is the oxidizing agent. But this specific example is what I want you to kind of keep in mind. Which one is getting oxidized and which one is getting reduced? So NAD plus gets reduced to form NADH. Lactate gets oxidized to form pyruvate. Okay, so that's an oxidoreductase. You have oxidation and reduction taking place within that reaction. Our next group, our next major class, are our transferases. The transferase, what we're going to observe is the transfer of a C, N, or P group. So for instance, a phosphate or carboxylate ion could be transferred. Now, in this example, what we elected to look at is an enzyme known as fructo or phosphofructokinase. This is also known as PFK1. What this enzyme does is it takes this molecule, fructose 6-phosphate, as well as ATP, and we transfer a phosphate group from adenosine triphosphate onto fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So the phosphate is going from ATP to fructose 6-phosphate. Therefore, we have a transfer of a group of a phosphorus-based group, a phosphate, and we leave behind ADP and a doubly phosphorylated fructose, okay? So that's, a, that's an enzyme that is a key regulatory step in the breakdown of glucose in the process known as glycolysis. So we're transferring a group with a transferase. Next up is our hydrolases. Well, from that, hydro, water's involved, lace, well, we have some sort of cleavage, some sort of breaking. An enzyme known as urease takes urea and makes, or urea and water and makes CO2 and, and, and two molecules of NH3. Now, what urea looks like is probably helpful whenever we are actually looking at this sort of reaction. What urea looks like, if you don't remember, or if you, it's not something that you've seen for a while or at all, urea looks like this. So we're going to use water. So that's where one of our hydrogens and our oxygen are coming from. And we're going to make two ammonia, ammonia ion, or ammonia molecules and carbon dioxide. So basically any reaction where water is used to break a bond. Next up are our lyases. Number four is our lyase. This is going to cleave a carbon-carbon, a carbon-sulfur, or a carbon-nitrogen bond. An enzyme example of that 
is an enzyme known as aldolase. This takes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate looks a little bit like this. We've got a five-membered ring. We have this molecule right here. So we've got carbon, carbon, carbon. We've got carbon, carbon, carbon. We have a total of six carbon molecules or carbon atoms within the structure. And what our lyase, aldolase, is going to do is it's going to break this bond right here. And what we're going to end up with is a molecule known as dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Well, dihydroxyacetone phosphate is going to be a, um, that is a ketose and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is an aldose. Both of these are three carbons. So we take a six carbon molecule by breaking a carbon-carbon bond right here, we end up with two three-carbon molecules. So that's what a lyase does. Our next enzyme class in isomerase, as you can kind of imagine from the name, isomerase, it's responsible for racemization of geometric isomers. So it, examples are phosphoglucose isomerase and phosphoglycerate mutase. Glucose, uh, phosphoglucose mutase takes glucose 6-phosphate and rearranges the carbons to make fructose 6-phosphate. Phosphoglycerate mutase is going to take 3-phosphoglycerate and simply move a phosphate group from carbon number 3 to carbon number 2. So it's just rearranging the atoms of a particular uh, molecule. A ligase, our last but not least enzyme complex or enzyme class, uh, is responsible for bond formation between carbon and oxygen, sulfur, or nitrogen, coupled by the hydrolysis of high energy phosphate bonds. So another way of putting this is this is making a bond between carbon and oxygen, sulfur, or nitrogen. And that's something that is not possible or cannot happen without taking ATP and breaking it into ADP and PI. So we're hydrolyzing that high energy phosphate bond. And what we're doing in the process is adding, in this case, CO2 to pyruvate to make oxaloacetate. So we have kind of a coupling of reactions. So ATP hydrolysis is coupled with the carboxylation and the addition of a carboxylate or carbon dioxide to pyruvate to make our oxaloacetate. So that's what we've got going on with the ligase. Now, one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is almost all of the enzymes that have been displayed on this slide and the previous slide have this number. So phosphoglycerate mutase has the number scheme of 5.4.2.1. This five, is the class, four is the subclass, two is the sub-subclass, and one is this specific enzyme catalyzed reaction. Now, when it comes to enzyme nomenclature, that number, that address type of number is beneficial and it is helpful, but that number is not the only way in which you identify an enzyme. It's most common to use, as you would imagine, the common name. So common names of enzymes, urease, alcohol dehydrogenase. Sometimes they even have, uh, what's the term, um, well-accepted, uh, they have well-accepted um, acronyms. For instance, alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH, um, and those are just two examples. You have a systemic name or systematic name, sorry. 
nomenclature system in which enzymes are named according to six major classes of enzyme or enzymatic catalyzed reactions, including subclasses and sub subclasses. You also have the classification number or EC number. Each enzyme also has a four part classification number. The numbers represent the class, subclass, sub subclass, and individual serial number. So sometimes someone might say, oh, well, um, use this term like isomerase and you know give a more detailed name than phosphoglucose isomerase um, but ultimately these are all kind of things that you figure out whenever you're within that field um, but i would say that the numbers knowing the six major classes is valuable uh, but specific numbers and some subclasses it's that's a bit extraneous um, okay so unless you're deep within that field. Let me clarify there. Now, cofactors and coenzymes. We already kind of talked about uh, not necessarily enzyme cofactors, but protein cofactors. Um, cofactors are small molecules that associate with enzymes to facilitate reactions that amino acids cannot alone do. Now, we've talked about something helping out a protein that the protein cannot do by itself. And the example that we looked at was heme. Heme was a molecule that was able to coordinate an iron ion and that iron ion was able to bind O2. The protein itself is not, or is highly unlikely to bind that O2. So just to dig a little bit deeper into that, your cofactors and enzymes, well, metal ions act as cofactors, and these are unique terms. So a cofactor is a metal ion. A coenzyme is an organic compound. These are sometimes also referred to as organic cofactors, but that specification of organic is key to uh, describe a coenzyme. Now, examples of these are NAD plus and NADH, which are involved in oxidation reductase or oxidoreductase enzymes. There are transient or tightly associated molecules with molecules that are transient or tightly associated with an enzyme known as co-substrates. These are coenzymes, so organic molecules that only transiently associate with the enzyme. But then there's also kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, those tightly associated compounds and molecules are prosthetic groups, coenzymes, again, organic in nature that are permanently associated with an enzyme. And I think heme provides a good example, although it's not in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, heme is a good example of a prosthetic group. It's, um, it's organic, but it can associate, it can give an enzyme or it can give a protein the ability to bind a metal ion. So basically, your cofactors are the, the best description of an organic molecule that is associated with an enzyme is it's a coenzyme and it's either a prosthetic group or a co-substrate. Now there's tons of different vitamins that are uh, coenzymes or co um, and many organisms are unable to synthesize parts of coenzymes. These parts must be present in the organism diet and are called vitamins. So just as some examples, if you go on to take uh, metabolism, you'll get into these. You'll get into FAD, NAD a little bit more, coenzyme A, PLP, B12. Um, yeah, all of these different compounds that are involved in fatty acid synthesis or degradation. Now, regeneration of coenzymes. Well, coenzymes are chemically changed in the reaction in which they participate but that coenzyme must be regenerated in order to complete the catalytic cycle. So the value of an enzyme is that it can catalyze a reaction and then regenerate itself so that it can catalyze it again and again and again and so on. Now in the reactions catalyzed by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, NAD plus gets reduced to NADH, which if you remember, there was reduction, we talked about NAD plus being reduced to NADH or the reduction reaction was NAD plus being converted to NADH. NADH must be oxidized back to NAD plus to allow multiple cycles of the reaction to occur. Now for transiently bound cofactors, sometimes the regeneration is accompanied by another enzyme. 
So there might be another enzyme that is involved in converting NADH back to NAD+. Now, in the case of prosthetic groups, the regeneration occurs in a separate phase of the, enzyme, of the same enzyme reaction sequence. When we study enzymes, we ultimately study a couple of different things. I mean, we can study the structure of an enzyme, but we also study or what I would say that we're most interested in is the kinetics and the catalysis. Now, kinetics is concerned with the timing, how fast does a reaction occur, and in which sequence do bonds break and form. Catalysis is concerned with structural changes that occur during a reaction. So how are the bonds made or broken? What are like what is the enzyme doing? What are the amino acids of that enzyme doing in order to make and break those bonds? What kinds of intermediates are formed and what kinds of interactions occur between the enzyme and the substrate, the products and their intermediates? So when you think about, or whenever I think about enzymes, I wanna know how fast it's going, how fast it's catalyzing the reaction, and then how is the enzyme interacting with the, the substrate and the product? And I wanna make a note that that term substrate, that's equivalent to a ligand or a ligand, but and it's the, the same terminology, protein ligand is analogous to enzyme substrate. So just to keep those straight, um, those are, yeah, it's important to recognize that, that subtle difference, but effectively the same thing. Now, enzymes differ from chemical catalysts in several ways. So one way in, the, in which they are differ is their higher reaction rates. Their conditions are much more mild and the reactions are much more specific. Add to all of that, they have the capacity for regulation. So here, I think it's, it's cool to look at specifically at the bottom. Um, staphylococcal nuclease is an enzyme that takes, that the reaction happens 1.7 times 10 to the negative 13th times per second. So if you wanted to write that out, that would look something like this. So if you took the reactants for the enzyme that is catalyzed, or sorry, if you took the substrates that staphylococcal nucleus would act on and you just put them in a beaker and you said, go, the reaction that staphylococcal nucleus would catalyze is going to happen that many times in one second. So then if you multiply it by 60, that many times per minute, we're talking about this reaction happening very, very infrequently. Now, if you took those same substrates and you added the enzyme, what you're looking at is this reaction is going to happen 95 times per second. Now, what that exhibits is that it shows a rate enhancement of 5.6 times 10 to the 14th. So this would be our catalyzed reaction versus non-catalyzed reaction. We've got yep. that many times faster. Now, some reactions are so slow in the absence of an enzyme that their half-lives begin to approach the age of the earth itself. Enzymes can accelerate reactions as much as 10 to the 17th, 17th over an uncatalyzed reaction. Urease is an example. Our catalyzed reaction is three times 10 to the fourth, whereas our uncatalyzed reaction is three times 10 to the 10th per second. Our ratio is one times 10 to the 14th. OMP decarboxylase, 40 times a second, whenever it's catalyzed, whenever it's not catalyzed by an enzyme, it's 2.8 times 10 to the negative 16th. Our ratio is 1.4 times 10 to the 17th. So considerably faster when we have an enzyme present. Now, how is it that an enzyme is capable of doing that? Well, when we think about this, we've got to think about thermodynamics. The free energy of a reaction predicts the spontaneity of a reaction. The farther the reaction is from equilibrium, the greater amount of work that needs to be done. 
So free energy is related to the concentration of the reactants and products. So those two things matter, but so does the intrinsic equilibrium constant for that reaction. So you can kind of, depending on the equilibrium, and depending on how far you are from the equilibrium, maybe you can kind of offset the extremeness by increasing concentrations. Now enzymes, this is one important thing, is that an enzyme is not going to change the free energy. Enzymes are going to accelerate the rate of the reaction, but how are they going to do that? Well, the way that they're going to do that is by manipulating the transition state. So here what we have is a model that shows our substrate going to our product and this kind of intermediate area, this, this transition state, this double dagger represents our transition state. A stable reactant must surmount a free energy barrier to be converted into a product. So we've got to go up the roller coaster to go down the roller coaster. Now, when we talk about an enzyme doesn't change the free energy, that's what we're talking about right there. The difference between the energy of our substrate and the difference between, sorry, the difference between the energy of our substrate and our product is a free energy change. The transition state is a species whose reacting bonds are midway to being formed or broken. Now, both the forward and reverse reactions have a ground state. The transition state represents the point of highest free energy for a reaction step at X double dagger. Now, X double dagger is the free energy of activation, the free energy of the transition state minus that of our reactants. So by what we can do if, or what an enzyme wants to do is take this transition state and make it something like that. So lower the energy of that, that transition state. Now, from a thermodynamic perspective, the rate of the reaction is proportional to the free energy or the transition state divided by RT. The greater the value of the delta G double dagger, the greater the value of our delta G uh, free energy of our transition state, the slower the reaction rate because the fewer molecules have the sufficient thermal energy to achieve the transition state free energy. The greater the value of the temperature, the faster the reaction. Now in two-step reactions, we've got two transition states. So our substrate or our reactant going to an intermediate, going to a product. There are movements from the reactant to the intermediate and the intermediate to the product. The shape of the transition diagram reflects the relative rates of the two steps. The step with the highest transition state free energy is said to be the rate determining step or a rate limiting step. So if we look at this graph right here, looking at our two-step reaction, we've got a double dagger and then our other transition state, we would say that, well, this right here is our rate limiting step. Now, what an enzyme is seeking to do when we look at a free energy diagram like this, Enzymes are going to act by lowering the transition state free energy. So this X double dagger, this transition state, well, what an enzyme wants to do is lower that so that we can get to that transition state a little bit with less energy, with less work. Now, the best question that you can ask is how? How is an enzyme going to lower the transition state? And the answer to that is by establishing covalent and non-covalent interactions between the enzyme and the substrate and the products. Now, like I said previously, an enzyme is biological catalyst. The efficiency of a catalyst is determined by the difference between the values of the transition state, free energy for the uncatalyzed and the catalyzed reaction, that delta, delta G double dagger. So this right here, The efficiency of an enzyme is by looking at the difference between this point and this point. The rate enhancement is given by E to the delta delta G double dagger over RT. A catalyst lowers the activation barrier by the same amount for both the forward and the reverse reactions. So 
what we see here is that this enzyme is going to take us from this point to this point, whether you're going from left to right or from right to left. So it in effect makes the forward and the reverse reactions a little bit easier to catalyze. Now is one ultimately easier than the other? Absolutely, but they both get a little bit easier. Now rate enhancement, this is what I want you to focus on. Rate enhancement is a ratio of the catalyzed reaction or the K of the catalyzed reaction versus the K of the uncatalyzed reaction. Now we haven't determined that K yet. We haven't talked specifically about that K, but that's K just like you learned in Gen Chem 2, and that is your um, rate constant. A tenfold rate enhancement only requires a delta delta G double dagger of only 5.7 kilojoules per mole. A typical hydrogen bond is 20 to 30 kilojoules per mole. So simple interactions in the transition state produce huge rate enhancements. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's reread that sentence. A tenfold rate enhancement only requires a delta delta G double dagger of only 5.7 kilojoules. Okay, so for this to go 10x faster, we need this delta delta G double dagger to change by 5.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay, well, a typical hydrogen bond is 20 to 30 kilojoules per mole. So it's essentially what that's saying is to get us 20 to 30 kilojoules per mole, establishing a hydrogen bond is like six times this. So if our transition state can establish a hydrogen bond that was previously not there, then we've already made it 60 times faster. So then if you think about that transition state establishing lots of different hydrogen bonds and lots of different, maybe even ionic bonds, well, then maybe we're talking about orders of magnitude of 600 times faster or 56 billion times faster, like what we previously saw. So when our substrate binds to our enzyme, um, what we want is our large enzyme to recognize the small substrate through a series of very weak forces. Now, substrate binding site generally is in a cleft or indentation on the surface of an enzyme that is complementary to the substrate. So here what we have is our model enzyme, and we have complementary regions on our substrate. For instance, these lowercase h's right here, well, let's look at those as hydrogens that are uh, a part of a hydrogen bond or hydrogen bond donating system. Well, then we have this oxygen that is either a part of a backbone or a part of a, sorry, uh, this oxygen is either a part of a backbone or a part of an R group. Well, there's this complementary region, this NH, that's either a part of a backbone or an R group that is able to form a hydrogen bond with that substance. So we have this hydrogen bond network, we have an ionic interaction that stabilizes this force or attracts our substrate to our enzyme and vice versa. So we have this shape complementarity, but we also have electronic complementarity. Now, one key component of enzymes is that they are very specific. Substrate specificity is going to drive the release of free energy. It's going to limit the number of substrates and that, or sorry, the number of substrates can fall into a couple of different categories. One is that an enzyme can be absolutely specific. That enzyme can catalyze the reaction of only one unique substrate to a particular product. An example of that would be the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase like CO2 and H2O, and that's it. There are enzymes that have relative, or relative specificity. These are enzymes that catalyze the reaction of structurally related substrates to give structurally related products. Example, alcohol dehydrogenase. It might take on methanol, it might take on ethanol, uh, propanol, and it's going to give off a product that is similar in structure to, or all the products that are similar in structure to one another. Now the structure of substrates 
is very important. Um, your substrates or the, the stereospecificity that's exhibited is uh, kind of a, a decider in which substrates are going to be generated. So your enzyme might catalyze a reaction in which only one stereoisomer is reacted or formed in preference of all others that might be reacted or formed. So essentially a way of looking at this is thinking about organic chemistry and saying, oh, well, we produced these two products and these two products were, uh, they made a racemic mixture. Well, in a biological system, you're not gonna be making a racemic mixture. You're gonna make this isomer and basically only this isomer. Um, substrates can also have specific shapes to them. Uh, we kind of looked at that with respect to our different enzymes, our different uh, molecular scissors, chymotrypsin, trypsin, and elastase. They would all cut after something very similar. They would all cut a peptide bond. But what was on the end terminate? Was it a positively charged residue? Was it an aromatic residue? What was it? Now, free energy changes upon binding. If we have a model where E plus S is our enzyme plus our substrate, we form this enzyme substrate complex. That enzyme substrate complex converts to an enzyme product complex which leads to a free enzyme and a free product being released. ES and EP are transient complexes of this enzyme with the substrate and product respectively. The binding of substrates releases free energy, which can be used to overcome transition barriers, which is what we see here. Here, what we see is our substrate in our uncatalyzed reaction goes to our transition state and that transition state then goes on to form a product. Well, our enzyme substrate complex is this intermediate. This enzyme product complex is another intermediate space that can ultimately lead to this product and lead to it with a considerably lower amount of uh, energy input. Now, substrate binding allows for entropy reduction. Substrates are oriented in the optimum way for chemistry to occur. Just like an enzyme or a protein is going to find its lowest free energy state, well, we're going to have our substrates manipulated in space to kind of complement that lowest energy state. We also see desolvation, so dissolving basically of substrates. And then we also see final um, or things that impact free energy. We see formation of weak interactions in our transition state. Um, we have enzymes and substrates interacting that might cause a conformational change within an enzyme. Okay, so all of this to say, one of the things that's most important for, for y'all is I want you to understand and I want you to know the different reactions that I went through for our different enzyme classes. I want you to know those. I want you to also know what is an enzyme cofactor versus a coenzyme and what are some ways in which they're used. Then what is this delta G double dagger? These are like the, the last few slides where we went over and looked at free energy diagrams. It's valuable information, but you'll have a little bit more context when we're talking about enzymes in, in greater detail. Now, with that to say, looking at a figure like this, I do want you to be able to tell me what delta delta G double dagger is. That's a change in the change of free energy for a transition state. And that's basically an indicator of how efficient an enzyme is. Well, I hope this was helpful and I hope it gives you a good taste for what to expect from our discussion of enzymes in the future. All right, well, have a good one.